Good evening. I'm Kelda Yoon. Israel's expected ground invasion of Lebanon appears to have gotten underway tonight. The Israeli military said its troops have begun limited raids against Hezbollah targets inside southern Lebanon. As the situation there grows increasingly unstable, efforts are underway here in the GTA to help those in the country who are now bracing for the worst. Delma Nakdak has more. Samar Hamadi flips through an old family photo album. This summer, she was in Lebanon making new memories with her three sisters who still live there, as well as many more extended relatives. The constant bombing has her worried for their safety. Emotionally uh, destroying us because we don't know what uh, next the threatening and uh, you know now they're threatening of uh, invasion land invasion so we don't know what's going to happen hamadi is helping to organize a fundraiser at the arabic culture club of ontario in the coming weeks so the hospitals are full cannot uh, take all and uh, we have one million displaced the situation in lebanon is becoming more volatile Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie posting to social media, urging Canadians there to take the next flight out. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I just arrived in Beirut safely. While that is happening, this Canadian flew in from Toronto. Yesterday, Osama Rakia arrived last week and has found himself nearby the bombings. Allahu Akbar. Extended rel relatives you're talking in the... I think we just heard a big explosion there. And at the end of the day, this is happening on a daily basis, numerous times a day. Um, and it's just getting more and more intense. So you have to normalize that within yourself. Rakia is helping other Islamic relief volunteers provide on the ground aid, a dangerous endeavor. The town just beneath us towards the south, the uh, paramedic services center was actually bombed. Uh, five uh, paramedic uh, staff were killed. All of them are young uh, university students who do this as volunteers. The town they're in was destroyed. Islamic Relief Canada is asking the local community in the GTA for help. So far we've distributed over 2,000 um, hygiene kits, 1,000 mattresses, um, 7,000 medical supplies and 3,000 food parcels. Um, we hope to send much more because we know a lot more is needed. Um, and we're waiting for people to um, continue to support our efforts. The organization is accepting monetary donations locally and coordinates in Lebanon to purchase and distribute supplies. Dale Manukduk, CBC News, Toronto. A community in North York is in mourning after a man was fatally shot early today at Jane and Lawrence. Toronto police appealing for witnesses tonight as they continue their search for a suspect. Brittany Billette has the latest. The family of Toronto's latest homicide victim held one another in grief and shock behind police tape. Officers blocked off the entire plaza on the busy northwest corner of Jane and Lawrence. The victim's body laid under a black tent set up by investigators. Police are identifying the victim as Anthony McBean, a 42-year-old man from Toronto. We got the call at 728 this morning and they had been shot already. So we are investigating. We want to see what, what had occurred. Police say the man was found with multiple gunshot wounds and they believe the shooting may have happened much earlier in the morning. So far, they don't have any information on a suspect, but the homicide unit is investigating. The incident has left community members concerned about gun violence in their neighborhood. This is not the first time for this area, maybe three times for here, two times across the street. It's just too much close to home. Honestly, I don't walk late at night because I'm kind of nervous. So if I'm going anywhere, I'll take an Uber to go where I'm going and it's my area. Why should I do that? A worker at this nearby restaurant says the shootings don't just terrify customers. The owners and their family live right above their business. It's scary because we do a lot of our stuff, maintenance and stuff at the restaurant, especially my dad, he's always out and about. So it, it, could, it might have been him, it could have been anyone, because we have family here who lives on the plaza as well, so it could have been any one of them. Police are asking anyone with information to contact Crime Stoppers. They're also asking anybody with dash cam or video footage to come forward. Brittany Ballette, CBC News, Toronto. Today is the fourth National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, also known as Orange Shirt Day, a day to honor residential school survivors and remember those who didn't make it. Here in Toronto, it began with a sunrise ceremony at Nathan Phillips Square. Chris Glover has more. Yo! 
A somber morning of reflection. More than 100 residential school survivors joining civic leaders at the newly minted Spirit Garden at Nathan Phillips Square. I congratulate all of the people that were involved in making sure that this happened. It's a new permanent space to honor residential school survivors and all the indigenous children who were lost. We uh, gather in a circle to learn from the elders, to let the drum beat, uh, feeling that our heart beat together. To everyone that's been involved in this project, what an honor it is to be here today and to take part in this. Artist Raymond Sky is the son of a residential school survivor and is proud his design is now a prominent part of Toronto. This kind of an acknowledgement uh, will bring, was long overdue, was long overdue, and it helped to bring the truth to the surface. You can't bury the truth forever. At R.H. King Academy in Scarborough, students designed their own art piece, an orange shirt mural made of pieces of cardboard, writing what truth and reconciliation means to them. So I really supporting each other because for truth and reconciliation, it's important to know how uh, we should support each other and other people and how like Indigenous people really matter. While in the library, some grade 11 students went deep into the 94 calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Specifically talking about call to action number 23, which explains uh, how Canada is trying, making efforts to increase the number of Indigenous people in our healthcare system. Athea Vasanthan was proud to educate her classmates about the power of having more Indigenous health workers in Canada. It's important because it creates a more diverse environment and it allows Indigenous people to get culturally relevant care. The workshop comes equipped with a QR code to quiz and gauge their learning. It's definitely like really meaningful because I feel like it's overlooked often. So it kind of gives like students and just people in general like an opportunity to learn about the different aspects of the Indigenous communities. Teacher Katie Warner says it was important to have the initiatives led by students. Their desire to learn about this is the most inspiring part of um, everything about this day um, because this is they are the future of this country. My job is to not only speak on Indigenous students but um, on behalf of all students at the TDSB. Darian Westra became the TDSB's Indigenous student trustee earlier this year. He wants to push for Indigenous language education in elementary schools and ensure his fellow classmates know about the calls to action that have still not happened yet. Unfortunately, our cult my culture is dying. It's a very sad pros prospect to hear. I think that's the right word. Um, and I want to sort of revive that by making um, the regional language that's spoken most here available to keep that language going. Demanding action was the focus of a rally in front of Toronto's Native Cultural Centre. Sisters in Solidarity organized the event in part to honour missing and murdered Indigenous women. I feel supported, uh, especially mentally, you know, it helps us a lot, you know, and it's making me really, really happy. <laughs> it's making me very happy. You know, this is my community. This, this, these are my people, you know, and the more, the merrier, you know, and I see there's a lot of different cultures that actually comes and support us. And this means a lot to me. Sarah DuPont brought her friend Helen Lee, who'd never been to a Truth and Reconciliation Day event before. And I always wanted to do something. And I just befriend her this year. She's like the best thing that happened in my, in my life this year. And I'm so glad I can finally do something to contribute. The kind of coming together from different backgrounds this day is all about. Chris Glover, CBC News, Toronto. The National Day for Truth and Reconciliation is a statutory federal holiday, but Ontario's only Indigenous MPP wants the day to be made a provincial holiday as well. Queen's Park reporter Lorenda Redekop has more. The NDP's Saul Mamakwa plans to propose Truth and Reconciliation Day be declared a paid provincial holiday. And it's always us, always us First Nations, and there's just people <laughs> reconciling. And, uh, and I think... Uh, it should be uh, alongside with all Ontarians. He'll be making the case at Queen's Park in his Indigenous language, the second time he'll speak it inside the legislature. After making history this spring, the first time a language other than French or English was spoken, along with official translation. 
The National Day for Truth and Reconciliation is a federal holiday, a day when many wear orange, a reminder of when a young Indigenous girl had her orange shirt taken away in residential school. Ontario public servants do receive the day off, paid, after an arbitration ruling with their unions, though other Ontario workers don't. There's no First Nation holidays in Ontario, and I think it's, you know, we're the first peoples of these lands. I think we should at least acknowledge that. Mama Kwa is a residential school survivor himself. He says today he was thinking about a friend of his, recounting the physical abuse he suffered at school in the late 80s. He was telling me when he got struck and said they didn't, they didn't, hit, they didn't hold back at all. They just give it their all and they strap you. A spokesperson for Ontario's Minister of Indigenous Affairs says they have not yet seen the proposed legislation and so don't want to presuppose anything, but says further consultation is needed, including with Indigenous communities. Mamakwa plans to bring this forward to the legislature in November. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. Welcome back. A play that depicts a group of Indigenous youth at a residential school putting on a Shakespearean production is now on stage in Toronto. 1939 will be running at the Berkeley Street Theatre until October 12th. As Talia Ricci reports, the cast hopes it will encourage audiences to reflect on Canada's past and future. <laughs> We are in the Berkeley Street Theatre, Bailey Theatre, here at Canadian Stage. We are in a play called 1939 uh, that was co-written by Caitlin Reardon and Jenny Lausanne and directed by Jenny Lausanne. And it is about a group of residential school children who are putting on a performance of All's Well That Ends Well for a pending arrival of the King and Queen of England. Where are the others? I thought you were bringing eight boys in total. Back the board. What was it like working with the cast over the last few months? It's been fantastic. Uh, we've we've really gelled really well. I find that we're a, a, a great cohesive unit working together. We have such a, a wide array of fantastically talented people. When you have a piece that has such a heavy subject matter, such a serious subject matter as, as residential school and people go in knowing that, you can feel it in the audience that reticence. That little bit of like, oh, I'm here to be serious, I'm here to learn something. But then of course, this show is actually quite funny, I think. And pretty much from scene one, we're cracking jokes, little things are happening, dynamics are emerging. And so there's a couple of lines that start to open people up to say, oh, this isn't the show that perhaps I was expecting. I can laugh. Uh, I can laugh, <laughs> I can have a good time, I can really grow to um, appreciate and love all of the characters in the show. It's all well and good for an Indian to be playing a countess, but we can't have one playing the king. A royal guest would be horrified. But it's the king of France in this play. <laughs> <laughs> There's something about laughter that kind of opens you up in a different way so that when we do talk about the more serious aspects of, of the children's experience, you're a little more open to the kind of the spectrum of emotion that does take place in this play. On that note, how do you think that theater can kind of be a vessel for teaching people about things that they may not know about? Well, I think this play in particular is a fantastic vessel because it, it focuses on the resilience of these kids rather than focusing on all of the atrocities that really happen. I mean, obviously it touches on those things, but it doesn't shove it in your face, I guess you can say. And I feel like this, this play is a really great opportunity for people to really start to question and educate themselves on the histories of Canada and people at residential schools. You can't be white and Indian at the same time. Welcome to my world. There's something about art and then there's something about, I'll say in particular, theater and live performance that is such an immediate art form that can have a different impact than, say, reading a book. I, I feel like I can acknowledge the realities that there aren't enough hours in the day, so when it comes to, you know, reading the calls to action from the TRC, most busy people might not have the time to really take in and consider and digest certain calls to action, but you can come see a play, you can make a night of it, you can get dressed up, and then you can experience some of these calls to action, you can experience some of these uh, moments of truth and reconciliation and start to begin 
to think about the ways in which you can participate in that reconciliation. And after people see this play, what do you hope they talk about or think about or feel afterwards? I think the word you said, talk about, I think that's that's probably the biggest thing that I would hope for is that they start talking. They start talking to each other, they start asking questions, they start reading books or articles and whatnot and just find out what the histories are and then like Brefney said, it's it's immediate and then they can start helping and creating that that bridge for that uh, truth and reconciliation to actually happen. Yeah. People can feel like they're a part of the history and more importantly a part of the future that they actually have a role to play in what comes next. Now. We are just weeks away from the start of the NBA season. Today the Toronto Raptors held their annual media day as they prepare for the first day of training camp tomorrow. As Greg Ross tells us it will be the first full season for this young Raptors roster. Raptors president Masai Ujiri used a word to describe this year's team that he has avoided using in the past. I would use the word rebuilding. Yes, in sports you always want to be competitive and you play to win. We're going to play to win, but it is a rebuilding team. I think everybody sees that like loud and clear. Big time. And it's also clear that this team is being built around one player. I want to continue to grow and build this team around uh, Scotty, who's 23 years old. How about this right here? Going to the 10. Now entering his fourth season in the league, Scotty Barnes says he is ready to step into the role as leader of the Raptors, something he says he prepared for in the offseason. This whole summer, I've just been working on my communication skills, uh, just trying to step into that next role of, you know, growing into that leader. Uh, you know, you got to just take steps, and, you know, I feel like I've been taking the right steps this summer. Barnes says he also communicated with his teammates in hopes of ensuring everyone was on the same page coming into camp. I feel like we're in a very comfortable space and we're all really tight, we're really connected. There are questions swirling about whether or not there is a similar connection between Masai Ujiri and the ownership group. There's been reports previously that he and specifically the Rogers section of MLSE haven't always been on the same page, and specifically when it came to negotiations. That could be a concern, with Rogers set to become the majority owner of MLSE in the coming months. Today, Ujiri admitted that there were some difficult discussions during contract negotiations a couple of years ago with Edward Rogers, the executive chair of Rogers Communications. Ujiri says that is in the past. We have a great relationship. We've had the same exact relationship uh, for 10 years. When you have negotiations, negotiations are tough. And people talk about like negotiating and uh, when we negotiated my contract, yeah, those things are, those periods are tough. I had tough negotiations with my, with my son, this, my three-year-old son this morning. The Raptors will officially open training camp tomorrow in Montreal, and that's also where they'll play their first preseason game on Saturday when they face the Washington Wizards at the Bell Center. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. Well, it's official Oasis is coming to Canada. The band announcing dates for its much-anticipated 2025 reunion tour today. The Gallagher brothers will make a stop in Toronto next August 24th, taking the stage at the new Rogers Stadium. It is the only Canadian stop on their tour. The last time Oasis played in Canada was way back on December 15th, 2008 in London, Ontario. Let's go to Colette now with a check on your forecast. And Colette, a few slightly cooler days ahead as we welcome October. Yeah, we are going to get a little bit of that cooler air moving in, but not for long, quite frankly. And certainly we haven't been feeling that anything but. You know, I'm showing you the temperatures from this morning, 6 a.m., 17 degrees. Uh, that was the low, well, 16.5. So we rounded up to 17 for Toronto. And that's a normal daytime high for this time of year. And of course, we didn't stop there. That's just where we were starting. Uh, 23 degrees, the high for today. And then let's add in a humid X value. So it actually, yeah, it's 
smuggy. You know, actually feeling like closer to 26. Uh, at one point I saw in southern Ontario Humidex around 29. So uh, that's the kind of air mass that we've been in and experiencing. And what's going to be happening now is that there's a cold front approaching and so with it it's going to bring in first some wet weather but then some drier air behind that which will be slightly cooler as we see our winds changing direction and coming around uh, more towards the northwest. So through the overnight into tomorrow morning it's not so much active weather as the chance to have some patchy fog developing kind of here and there so just something to be mindful of it can make things a little bit slower for those first you know few moments or first hour or so until the sun what sun we have coming through can burn that off and then we'll see kind of a mix of sun and cloud to mostly cloudy skies then in the afternoon a few isolated showers are possible highly isolated but the more organized stuff along that cold front is likely that timing going to be tomorrow evening okay so that works its way through uh, southwestern Ontario especially a chance for an embedded thunderstorm uh, this chance for that in the GTA but it's a little bit lower and so as that is moving through we're also going to find the winds kicking up a little bit but then the clearing behind this 3 a.m. and we're already seeing things clearing out skies will be clear by the time the sun comes up on Wednesday morning and that morning commute will be a dry one and in fact some pretty nice conditions although the air well if you are not enjoying the mugginess the air will have that drier feel to it so in general other than where we might locally get a thunderstorm here or there uh, we're really talking about it being in that range of about 5 to 10 millimeters of rainfall the winds they're nothing to speak of until we get the front coming through later in the day tomorrow and that's when more so again in southwestern Ontario but that's again when we're going to find the winds kicking up a bit a little bit gusty and then they turn to the northwest behind uh, and then we get into some cooler overnight temperatures once we get into that pocket but not so much tonight still above seasonal 22 the high as we go into tomorrow 18 on Wednesday and sunny and then those temperatures start to bounce up once again Kelda. Thanks so much Colette. You're welcome.